But hello, church history friends. Welcome. My name is Barb Walden, and I am thrilled that you are joining us tonight as we kick off the winter series with Cheryl Bruno and Dr. Nick Litursky. Cheryl and Nick are the historians behind the new book, Method Infinite, Freemasonry and the Mormon Restoration. Tonight is our first online program of the new year, and I couldn't be more excited that Cheryl and Nick are here with us this evening. Our Evening with the Historians Winter Series is not only a great way to learn church history and to meet the scholars behind the latest discoveries in restoration history, it's also an opportunity to support preserving the past. So donations during the Winter Series support the ongoing maintenance and preservation of all five Community of Christ historic sites. So friends, we couldn't host programs like tonight without your generous support. Thank you for helping preserve church heritage. Well, Seth Bryant is joining us from Kirtland and he will serve as our host tonight. So welcome to Seth. And from sunny Florida, we have Peter Smith co-hosting tonight and he'll help manage things from behind the scenes. So thank you, Peter. Now, lastly, we have Lachlan Mackay joining us from Independence, Missouri. Uh, Locke will share a few artifacts that connect to tonight's topic. Uh, these historic items come from the Community of Christ Museum collection and a private collection. Uh, Locke will share immediately following our main presentation. So just one more thing to look forward to tonight. So with that said, I'll turn the microphone and the spotlight over to you, Seth to share the plan uh, for the evening and tell us about our special guest historians. Well, thank you, Barb, and good evening to all of you. It's good to be back and starting a new year with an exciting new series. And as you mentioned, tonight we're going to kick off with the kick off the winter series by taking a look at Nick and Cheryl's book, Method Infinite, Freemasonry and the Mormon Restoration. All right, I'm going to share our bios for our guest historians. Nicholas S. Litursky, J.D., Ph.D., is an adjunct senior lecturer in psychology at the California Institute of Integral Studies and a professional spiritual guide. Their research interests include in-depth psychological reflections on spirituality, paleolithic cave art, ceremonial magic, sexual orientation, and gender identity. Nick's work has been published in the Farms Review of Books on the Book of Mormon, Psychological Perspectives, a quarterly journal on Jungian thought, Eminence, the journal of applied mythology, legend, and folklore, Somatics Magazine, Journal of the Mind, Body, Arts, and Sciences, and the recent compilation, The Reality of Fragmentation and the Yearning for Healing, Jungian Perspectives on Democracy, Power, and Illusion in Contemporary Politics. And then Cheryl, Cheryl L. Bruno has a BS in Recreation Management from Greensboro College and did graduate work in Educational Psychology at Brigham Young University. Cheryl is an independent researcher on Mormon history with publications in the Journal of Religion and Society, the John Whitmer Historical Association Journal, and the Journal of Mormon History. She is also pre presented at the Mormon History Association Annual Conference, the Claremont Mormon Studies Conference, the Pacific Northwest Region Annual Meeting of the American Academy of Religion and the Society of Biblical Literature, uh, the John Whitmer Historical Association Annual Conference, Sunstone Symposium, and the Mormonism and Western Esotericism Conference. In addition, Cheryl is Director of Resident Life at Madonna Gardens Assisted Living and Memory Care, has published personal essays in poetry in several anthologies, and has created a deck of Mormon-themed tarot cards. Those might be the funnest uh, bios that I have read <laughs> while hosting. So we're excited to have uh, both of you here tonight. And uh, Nick and Cheryl's presentation is called Integrating Freemasonry in Your Concept of Mormon History. So thank you for taking time this evening to share with us, and I'll turn the floor over to you. Okay, I'm going to get started for us today. Welcome to everyone who's here. So nice to have so many people come and listen to us talk. And we hope that we'll have something interesting for you to, uh, to listen to tonight. I am gonna share my screen with you. And here we go. Um, title of our presentation today, 
integrating Freemasonry into your concept of Mormon history. So we hope that we can expand your understanding of how and why this esoteric organization, Freemasonry, became part of the Mormon Restoration. I hope to blow your mind a little bit. All right. So um, Method Infinite is the book that Nick and I wrote with Joe Swick. I have a copy of it here. There we go. And we had such a great time writing this book. Um, this is research from over 20 years, starting with Nick's research in Freemasonry and Mormonism, and just came to pass in 2022. I hope a lot of you have this book. I think a lot of you do. And if not, at the end of tonight, you will want to get it, I'm sure. Uh, Method Infinite is a story of how Freemasonry influenced the Mormon Restoration. It is packed with information. I'm going to tell you a little bit, um, a little background to what I'm going to be talking about tonight, and that is the power of story. And about two months ago, I was sitting in my living room on my computer on a Zoom conference of a bunch of influencers of senior living communities. And this is not the actual people who were there, but just kind of a picture to show you the diversity of the group that we had uh, together that evening. And our facilitator drew uh, a couple people out of the audience uh, to start the conference out with and just had them share their personal story of how they got involved in senior living. And to me, that was the most valuable part of the conference. It was amazing what power those stories had of how people had um, gotten into senior living. Some had a business background, some had a background in um, just kind of wacky personal, what are those um, life coaching? <laughs> life, I hope there's no life coaches in the audience, but um, we had life coaches. We had people who um, were not long ago living under a bridge, you know, homeless. So we had this huge diversity of experience. We had old people, we had young people, and I realized just the power that a personal story can have. So if I had all of you out in front of me today in an audience where I could actually see your faces, I think what I'd do is ask you to tell just a little bit about your personal story and what experience you have with Freemasonry. Because I bet there's some people out in the audience, actually know there's some people out in the audience because I saw your, your names. And I know there's some people out there who are Freemasons themselves, so know a lot about Freemasonry. Then others of you may have only heard a tiny bit about Freemasonry from maybe when you were 20, you heard about um, some uh, plot to take over the world from Freemasons. And that's all you know or think you know about Freemasonry. So we have a, a wide variety of experience and a wide variety of personal stories. But tonight we're going to give you some information and we're going to give you a little bit about the story in Freemasonry. Now, for those of you who don't know too much about it, um, Freemasonry includes myth, legend, allegory, lore, metaphor, symbol, and dramatization, all of these tools to help people become better uh, people. And they these things will... Um, will uh, plant ideas into um, the mind and the soul and in a way that you can't just do by lecturing or you can't just do by reading but when you actually dramatize something it does something to you using your physical body and when you use symbol symbolization that is something that's going to go into your mind in a way that um, is really quite amazing so um, one of the, I'll start with one of the well-known stories in Freemasonry, and this is the story of the building of King Solomon's temple. So there it is in all of its glory. Um, so this story tells about um, this, it's like an allegory that, cho that shows the importance of personal moral characteristics. And um, in this story, King Solomon, who's known for his wisdom and wealth, commissions this magnificent temple in Jerusalem to house the Ark of the Covenant. And it's really a quite a good metaphor for the building of someone's character. As each stone is placed in the building, it represents a lesson in morality. 
uh, Freemasons are encouraged to work on themselves, just like the Masons worked on the temple in order to become the best versions of themselves they can be. <laughs> That's my grandchild. Okay, um, so we have that great story of, um, of Solomon's temple. And um, we, in, in throughout Freemasonry, there's um, these stories and these legends that are told that are um, intended to expand the mind and to help you um, get moral lessons to help you work on yourself. And Freemasonry in 19th century United States was very well known. So people knew these stories in a way that we don't know this today. Uh, people just don't have Freemasonry in their experience today like it was in the 19th century. Back then, about one in eight men were Freemasons. So your father or your uncle or your dentist was a Freemason, and you knew quite a bit about it. It was, um, we had some of the newspapers of the day published Masonic poetry, um, or different lectures were given at Christian churches by Freemasons. And so everybody knew kind of this, um, the way that the Freemasons were able to use symbol. And um, I think this is one of the things that appealed to Joseph Smith about Freemasonry. He knew it quite well. And his father and um, his brother were both Freemasons. We believe that Joseph Smith Sr. became a Freemason. And we know that Hiram Smith became a Freemason before Joseph did. And so he was quite familiar with all of the legends in Freemasonry. So from an early, early age, uh, he had this... Um, this esoteric influence in his life. And um, so we see a lot of influence of Freemasonry in as early as Joseph Smith's first vision. And you're gonna find this really fascinating. Um, so Joseph Smith's first vision kind of has a Masonic flavor to it because we have um, the principle of Masonic initiation is, um, is illuminated by Joseph Smith's first vision. And um, the initiation in Freemasonry is this concept of almost like today we would call it being woke, you know? You, so you awaken to this, um, this um, spiritual side of yourself or you have an experience with deity and you have this initiation into this higher plane. And that is what Joseph Smith's vision is all about. And we have um, many different accounts. Well, not many. We have several accounts of Joseph Smith's vision, not from 1820, but starting in 1832, we have um, written accounts of Joseph Smith's vision. There are four that were actually given by Joseph Smith, or four or five, um, that he either wrote or had written down. And then there were four additional accounts that were written by others um, who were telling Joseph's story during his lifetime. So we have these several accounts and they're told in different ways um, to different audiences. However, by 1832, um, the, the stories had coalesced into um, sort of a, a ritualistic story with um, elements, the same elements in the same order and kind of um, formulated like um, a Masonic ritual would be. So this is something we do talk about in our book. And if you wanna know more about this, I hope you read, I can't tell you everything that's in the book, but um, this is like one of my favorite chapters because I love seeing the Masonic influence that happened as he was telling his story. The other thing that's interesting is as others are telling it, they bring in Masonic language. So we don't even know if Joseph himself was thinking Masonically, but as people heard the story, it clicked in their brain. Oh, this is, you know, a Masonic-like telling. Um, so the newspapers of the day would describe Joseph Smith as being either of Mason or an anti-Mason because they knew there was some kind of connection there. All right, so then we have the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, which is also told in this Masonic language. And this picture that I got from the internet doesn't have um, some of the elements that were described in, in the 
accounts, but some of the accounts have like pillars that they're resting on, different Masonic, which is very important in Masonry, the pillars. And then if you see the little inset over in the corner there that I put in, um, it's but the some of the accounts talk about a um a lid that was over the top of the stone box that had a ring that you could pick it up. And this is very similar to that picture is um, a little um, charm that Masons have of the lid over Enix, um, the tunnel going down to find Enix um, gold plate. So it, like a lot of these, these descriptions remind you of the Masonic lore. Going. Okay, so this is when I first saw this, I died because this is a little Masonic charm and it looks just like our conception of the Book of Mormon, doesn't it? Um, the, of the gold plates. Um, and so let me see if I can move this little um, picture there so I can read. Okay, so um, we have these Masonic features and accounts describing the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. One of the interesting ones is Fayette Lapham's account, because he includes masonry very overtly. And he talks about an interview that he had with Joseph Smith Sr., who told him that underneath the first golden plate lay the stone spectacles that would later be named the Urim and Thummim. And this is the quote, on the next page were representations of all the Masonic implements as used by Masons at the present day. So look like this little book is <laughs> so it's very similar to what you see Fayette Lapham talking about there. Um, so I was listening to a podcast by Don Bradley and he talked about this quote and he was telling about how when he was thinking of Masonic implements, he was thinking of the square and compasses, which in every Masonic lodge, when the lodge is opened, the book of the law, which is usually the Bible, is placed on the, on the altar and it has on top the uh, square and compasses, which are Masonic implements. And so when we read this account, it just calls, if you're a Mason, that calls that to mind immediately. So um, there's so many things in the book that um, are things like this that, that you are seeing um, someone who's steeped in masonry talking about um, as relating to the Book of Mormon. Now, you all know that there are stories in the Book of Mormon that have to do with masonry. We have secret combinations. We have aprons being worn by the Lamanites, and we have um, a cable toe or a, um, a cord going around the neck. Um, and I want to tell you, there are many others that you have not picked up before. So I'm going to tell you one of them. A familiar story from the Book of Mormon is um, Nephi and Laban. And many of you are familiar with the story where Nephi is trying to get the brass plates, which are the scriptures, from Laban. And Laban will not give them to him. So Nephi goes back into Jerusalem and finds Laban lying down, passed out in the streets of Jerusalem. And he takes his sword and with Laban's own sword cuts off his head in a very grisly fashion. Um, but this is to um, communicate a lesson. And you know what the lesson is because it's better than one man should perish than an entire nation should dwindle in unbelief. That's the lesson. I know it like the back of my hand, and so do you, um, because it's this um, potent story that is teaching a lesson. And this is what Masons do. They tell these stories, and they bring, they put an image in your mind, and then you understand what is trying to be communicated. There is a very similar story in one of the Masonic rituals about Jobert and Akirope. Now, Akirope is... Um, one of the people who killed Hiram Abiff, who some say is a representation of Jesus Christ. So um, Akirob goes and hides, and you can see him in a cave here outside the walls of Jerusalem. You see in the background that you see Jerusalem in the background there. Akirob is sent out to find them, 
and he finds Akiro hiding in a cave. He takes the sword and he cuts off his head. And this is also to teach a lesson, um, actually several lessons, but one of them being vengeance um, to those who would, you know, crucify, symbolically crucify Christ. Um, they will lose their head. <laughs> so um, these are very important things in Freemasonry to teach these lessons, and it might seem um, odd to our sensibilities today, but back then this was an important way that we could um, put something into our mind and into our heart. So let me go on quickly. The last thing I'd like to cover today is temples, Joseph's temples here. I've got the Kirtland Temple and the Nauvoo Temple. And up on the top there is Solomon's Temple. Now, uh, we all know that Joseph's temples were supposed to be after um, the representation of Solomon's Temple. And many people say, well, oh, well, that could just be, he could have just taken that from Solomon's Temple in the Bible. However, if he was taking his inspiration from biblical temple, the biblical temple of Solomon is quite different. We find animal sacrifice. We find blood and gore in the temples of the Old Testament. And in actuality, Joseph's temples are much more like the Masonic conception of what Solomon's temple was. And so we have in given in our Mormon temples, we have an endowment of power, or we have rituals that are taking place in the temple, similar to and dramatizations in um, in the Nauvoo temple. So this is similar to what happens in a Masonic temple, but not an Old Testament temple. Um, and one thing I'd like to talk about that our book kind of brings up and um, makes you think about because there are many, many things that when you read our book, you'll start thinking about. And um, one thing I've thought about recently is the concept of presentism and temple changes that are happening right now in the Brighamite tradition. Um, they've recently uh, changed and adjusted our temple ceremony, which I think is great because um, what's happened is the symbolism that was put into the early temples, the early Latter-day Saint temples, um, is no longer the same today. So we had a certain symbolism, for example, of women veiling themselves. And that meant something in the 19th century. And now it means something completely different. So we have, we feel um, as women, when we're veiling ourselves, that we're subjugating ourselves, we're being put down. And so when the symbolism changes, we have to adjust that because we don't want it to symbolize something or mean something to people that it's never intended to mean in the first place. So I think a lot of times temple changes are good, but what we have to look out for is something called presentism. And I'm gonna explain that concept by showing you this picture of this is representing me as a little girl. So I may be eight or 10 years old and when I was a little girl, we had this little um, ditty that we'd say to each other when we wanted to promise that we would either keep a secret or I promise I'll do something. We'd say, cross my heart and hope to die, stick a needle in my eye. And a lot of you can remember saying that if you're a certain age. But um, over the years, this has changed a little bit. When I was a little girl, we never thought anything of this did not seem like violent imagery to us at all. It was just something we said to, pro to make a promise. And um, over the years, there's been songs written with these words in it, cross my heart and hope to die about um, someone following your lover into death, you know? And <laughs> when I asked my grandchild if she'd ever heard cross my heart and hope to die, she said, oh yes, but I would never say that. And I said, why not? She said, because I, because killing yourself is a sin. <laughs> so, um, so I was thinking now if, if my grandchild um, read in my diary from when we, I was her age and read that, um, cross my heart and hope to die, stick a needle in my eye, she might have thought, wow, um, my grandma, when she was young, already had suicidal tendencies. And that is presentism when you're putting something that something that you're thinking today in the present 
back into history. So we have to be careful when we study Masonry and Mormonism that we don't put our modern sensibilities back into what they were thinking. And it's a kind of a, a hard tightrope to walk because we do want to have learned something in all these centuries and years. Um, we want to have learned something from and from the past, but we don't want to put our ideas into their minds. So that's important. Um, my last slide here is uh, many of the symbols that we encounter in Mormonism. And a lot of these you will recognize, all, all of these are Masonic symbols. And um, sometimes we get people who look at our book and they say, oh, well, you know, this particular symbol may have been from Egyptian, ancient Egyptian rites, or this symbol came from the Bible, or this symbol came from Campbellism. And that might be true if you're looking at each particular symbol. But if you look at them as a whole, and you clump them all together and say, here's the symbols we have in Mormonism, and you see that every single one of them is a Masonic symbol, then that tells you something that um, we are not, Nick and I are not saying that um, there weren't influences in Mormonism from Campbellism or from ancient the ancient past or from the Bible. We do believe that that happened. However, when you see all of these, this conglomeration of story, information, legend, and even in our book, we have coincidence that happens. And, um, and all of these things, when you see the Masonic influence in all of them, then that really gives you pause. So we hope that you'll read our book and get a little bit more out of it. And now I'm going to pass the time over to Nick. Thank you, Cheryl. I'm going to move fairly quickly. I know that uh, we do have a time limit on uh, what we were supposed to present, and I've got about seven or eight minutes. So I'm going to move quickly. Uh, please forgive me. But I just want to uh, briefly talk about the fact that when Joseph Smith was killed, and along with Hiram, we have found in our research that there were many different forces brought into that. One of those forces was the Masonic Brethren. Before Joseph Smith and Hiram Smith were killed, while they were in the jail, a group of Masons from around the country gathered in Hamilton's Tavern in, Han in Carthage. Hamilton's ta Tavern in the upper room is where the Masonic Lodge of Carthage joined for their regular meetings. This group came together and had a conversation about how they wanted to make sure that Joseph did not increase in authority and influence. And they feared that he would come into the presidential chair, is the wording in the record. Normally, we read that and we think, oh, well, Joseph was running for president in the United States. But everything else in that document talks specifically about Masonic symbols, such as the person guarding at the door, a Tyler. All these various things come in to where it's clear. Why would they be concerned that Joseph would have an authority in Masonry? Because an ongoing effort was happening at that time to form a Grand Lodge of the United States. And so many Mormons had become Masons under Joseph Smith's direction that they were almost overwhelming the fraternity nationwide. As such, Joseph had a voting block, so to speak. If there had been a Grand Lodge of the United States, there could have been Joseph Smith as Grand Master of the United States, and that was not acceptable to the powers that be. Some of these individuals that came over to Carthage while Joseph and Hiram were in jail were high officials in Freemasonry from other states. For example, Priestley McBride, the Grand Master of Missouri, was there in Carthage, and then a couple of days later was down in Quincy, having a party with the Masons in Quincy to observe St. John's Day. That was a Masonic, one of two Masonic festivals of the year, and his responsibility would have been to be celebrating with his own brethren and in his own state where he served as Grand Master. But no, he was in proximity over close to what was going on with Joseph and Hiram. The same was true of Stephen Carnegie, a nationally prominent Freemason from Missouri, who was over in Quincy keeping a close eye on things. I want to take you to immediately after the, the murder of Joseph and Hiram. 
Specifically, I want to take you to June 28, 1844. On that day, Joseph and Hiram's bodies were brought to the Nauvoo Mansion House. And the structure, of course, was, was larger at the time. We know that you know part of the structure has been taken down since then. But I want to give you a little schematic here because Joseph and Hiram's bodies were laid out here in the dining room lengthwise along the wall below these windows. Dan Jones wrote about the scene. He said, there they lay in their coffins side by side, majestic men as they suffered side by side from prison to prison for years, and they labored together shoulder to shoulder to build the kingdom of Emmanuel. Eternal love bound them steadfastly to each other and to their God until death. And now my eyes beheld the blood of the two godly martyrs mingling in one pool in the middle of the floor. Their elderly mother, godly and sorrowful on her knees in the midst of the blood between the two, a hand on each one of her sons who lay in gore, her heart nearly broken by the excruciating agony and indescribable grief. We're, most of us are familiar with the story of Emma and, and Hiram's wife coming in and being so distraught and Emma having to be brought, carried out of the room and then brought back in when she gathered herself. Another encounter of, of this time was a doctor who came from out of town who, and appeared in Nauvoo at the time of the martyrdom. He was there to see this early family viewing. He said, while the two wives were bewailing their loss and prostrate on the floor with their eight children, I noticed a lady standing at the head of Joseph Smith's body, her face covered and her whole frame convulsed with weeping. She was the widow of William Morgan, a Masonic memory, and 20 years before had stood over the body of her husband found at the mouth of Oak Orchard Creek on Lake Ontario. She was now the wife of a Mr. Harris, whom she married in Batavia, and who was a saint in the Mormon church and a high mason. She's a very short person with light hair and very bright eyes and a pleasing countenance. I had called on her a few days previous to this occasion, and while conversing with her, put my hand on a gilt-edged volume laying on the stand. It was Stern's on Masonry and contained the likeness of William Morgan. She said she'd taken it out and thought if the mob did come and she was obliged to flee, she would jump into the Mississippi and she would take it with her. Now, the book that was referred to there is an inquiry in the speculative nature of Freemasonry. And this book, the problem with this account is this book does not have a frontispiece image of William Morgan in it. More likely, this recollection is talking about a different book, Light on Masonry by David Bernard. And as you can see here, the book indeed has a frontispiece of William Morgan. So I want you to imagine, if you will, Lucinda Morgan having this image before of a husband who died prior to the uh, prior to the availability of photography and this is the only image she has of the father of her children and she's ready to take that with her over the mississippi but now she happens to be standing at a family viewing at the head of joseph smith's coffin uh, a place that would normally be considered a, a position of honor and she's there weeping so why do i go on about these books why does the book say anything important well, it goes back to the legends of Freemasonry. Cheryl mentioned briefly about the killing of Hiram Abiff. Hiram Abiff was the architect of the temple. He was murdered by people who wanted to know the secrets of the Mason's craft, and in particular, the grand secret word of a master Mason. Hiram Abiff was murdered, and his killers hid the body. First, they buried him in a rubbish heap outside the west gate of the temple site. Then they waited until after midnight, took the body westward, and buried it at the brow of a hill. Third, they marked the grave with an acacia tree, which ended up giving away the location. Fourth, King Solomon sent fellow crafts, or workers on the temple, to find the body of Hiram Abiff. Once the body was found, King Solomon had him reburied in a sacred and permanent place of honor. Well, Cheryl said that there are even coincidences. And I like to think of them as myths and legends reliving themselves, uh, because we see that over and over in history. 
Freemason, one of the common images of Freemasonry is this weeping virgin who is bemoaning the loss of the temple. Uh, very much like the image described of Lucinda over, jo over the coffin of Joseph. The body of our Grand Master was buried three times. First in the rubbish of the temple, second on the brow of a hill west of Mount Moriah, and thirdly and lastly as near the Sanctum Sanctorum, or Holy of Holies, of King Solomon's temple, as Jewish law would permit. So, the following day, the public funeral happens. Once the public funeral was finished, a the bodies of Joseph and Hiram were hidden in a closet in the mansion house, just off the dining room. Fake coffins were brought, they were filled with stones, and carried out for a public procession. By this time, Joseph had built a family tomb on, on the temple site. Uh, I have to credit Joseph Johnston for exhaustive work in finding the location of that tomb, and it does appear that it was on the corner of the temple site itself. It was nearly finished at the time of the martyrdom and probably would have been finished uh, in the last stages, putting the doors on and such uh, right at that time. There was a fear that if they put the bodies in this public tomb, that somebody would take those bodies because there was a price literally on gathering the head of Joseph Smith. So fake, uh, fake coffins were taken to the tomb. The real coffins, of course, were buried initially in the Nauvoo Cemetery. So Joseph was murdered and his family hid the body. First, the family hid Joseph and Hiram's body in a closet while the fake coffins were buried. But then, that night, at midnight, nine Freemasons were gathered and moved the body southward. They buried them in the northwest corner of the foundation of the Nauvoo House, which happens to be at the brow of a small rise or hill near the river. Of course, here's David Hiram Smith's image. Give it a little different perspective. Well, eventually work was going to begin again on the Nauvoo house. And so there was concern that the bodies would be disturbed. So once again, in the autumn of 1844, at midnight, four Freemasons secretly moved the bodies northwestward under Emma's direction to the homestead property where they marked the grave by moving a bee house on top of them. Subsequent to that, the bodies were moved to a secret location in Davidson Hibbard's woods. Uh, David Hiram Smith, of course, frequented a spot in the, on that property that came to be known as David's Chamber. And around 1863, David would compose his hymn, The Unknown Grave. Emma, later, at some unknown time, with the assistance of a trusted servant by the name of Cleveland, moved the bodies back to the homestead, this time placing them beneath the existing foundation of a spring house. Emma would later be buried nearby, and the site gradually fell into decay, and its specific location was forgotten. Finally, in 1928, President Frederick, w, Frederick M. Smith, the Joseph's grandson and, a, and an accomplished Freemason, sent W.O. Hands to find the bodies, just as King Solomon had sent workers to find Hiram Abiff's body. Once the bodies were found, uh, with the aid of, of faith, quite frankly, President Smith had had them reburied in a sacred and permanent place of honor where they remain today. So this pattern uh, has repeated itself, and we found it interesting. We don't know for sure that Emma knew enough about Freemasonry to plan this all out. I kind of suspect she had a good idea of the story and that she took some wisdom from it. These are the kind of things that we discovered as we dove deeper into these stories. And had I had more time to talk with you, I could have shared more, but this gives you a nice taste. Thank you for listening. Well, thank you, Nick, and thank you, Cheryl, for presenting and uh, just some amazing research. We are going to take a pause before the Q&A and turn things over to Locke, who's got some historic artifacts to share with us related to the topic tonight. Fascinating. I also like to thank Nick and Cheryl. Um, Really, really interesting. Uh, I'm gonna share just a few Smith family Masonic objects. Some of you, I think you've probably, uh, folks have probably seen before. The first one is from Community of Christ's collections. And this is Joseph Smith Jr.'s Masonic apron. 
that came to Community of Christ through F. Henry Edwards, who was, of course, the son-in-law of Frederick Madison Smith, so likely came down through Fred M. Uh, Joseph Johnston noted that there are almost identical or perhaps identical aprons belonging to some of the 12 in the Daughters of the Utah Pioneers Museum in Salt Lake. So these were likely being uh, somehow commercially produced. Uh, I'd be interested, uh, maybe a question for Nick and Cheryl, is this different from other Masonic aprons at the time? My sense is it's probably very much like other Masonic aprons at the time. But Joseph Smith Jr.'s Masonic apron, one of my favorite artifacts in our collection. As Nick pointed out, though, Frederick Madison Smith was also very involved in Freemasonry. And I want to share just a couple of, of uh, a number of Fred M's Masonic aprons. These are from a private Smith family collection. This one is the one that first captured my attention just because it's so beautiful. Um, I think it's from uh, when he became a master mason, looks like 1936. I'm sure we have some folks that can tell us more about him. Jason Smith, who's with us tonight, uh, is, has helped me understand them much better, but I've got a long way to go. So I thought this one was extraordinarily beautiful. But it turns out this one is probably the, the, the more important and the special one. Uh, this is his first one. And it came from Carbondale, Colorado, Lodge number 82. Jason reached out to me with some questions about uh, Fred M's induction dates uh, um, and why Colorado. Uh, so we were able to check Fred M Smith's journals uh, and found a few more details. Uh, Jason noticed that it was kind of uh, unusual that Fred M went through three degrees in six weeks. So it seems to have been elevated pretty quickly. Um, also unusual that he's from Missouri, but he's joining in Colorado, apparently not, not common. And why Carbondale? So it's south of, was that Glenwood Springs? Uh, and on a train line going south, my speculation is that even just a little further south than Carbondale is Marble, Colorado. You see a picture here of marble, and that is where Fred M. and, and the RLDS Church purchased a marble quarry to build sacred buildings, um, the, maybe temple someday, things like that. So I don't know if he was um, on business in marble and connected with folks in Glendale, or if there were church members there, just do not know. But the three pages you see below the mountain photo are Fred M's journals on the day that he um, is inducted. And it's they're kind of cryptic references, um, but um, let's see, it looks like 1927, February and March, 1927. So just a few um, Fred M Masonic elements as well. And I'll stop there. All right. And with that, we will bring our evening program to a close. Thanks again to our friends, Dr. Nick Letursky and Cheryl Bruno for sharing their research and about uh, just, I mean, we, I could honestly listen to this all night long, uh, this fascinating history that's contained in their book, which if you haven't uh, got a copy, if you haven't read it, I encourage you to head over to the Red Brick Store, redbrickstore.com to pick up your copy of Method Infinite. We also want to thank Locke uh, for dropping in and sharing those historic treasures with us tonight. And lastly, I want to thank all of you. It was exciting to see so many uh, friends on the list of attendees and in the chat. Uh, just excited to have you all here for another evening sharing church history. I hope you'll join us next Thursday for another lecture uh, when we gather with Quincy Newell to hear the fascinating story of Jane Matting James. The online program will take place at 7 p.m. Central Time. Barb has just dropped the link to Thursday's program where you can learn more and register for next week's discussion. So until next time, take care, everyone. Keep reading your church history and have a good night. Thanks. <laughs>